Pirate 101 has a 10 year old story, so it's about time we go back to the beginning and remember how far we've come. Welcome to the story so far. We start our adventure locked in a prison on board Deacon, the spymaster of the Armada's ship. Boochbed and Gandry find us to help us break out, sending us to Captain Avery, who has a pirate haven in Skull Island. Captain Avery says he will help us, but we need to work for it. He sends us on a mission to find one of his crewmates, Finn, who has stolen his jade amulet and fled deep into Skull Mountain. We meet Bonnie Ann, who is trying to calm the Troggies down, and after helping her scout the Troggy slingshots, she joins our crew to find Finn. We meet Ensign Livesey, who is locked up by the Troggies. We free him, and he tells us Finn is intending to sell the amulet and is hiding in the temple in Skull Cave. We get to the throne room, however, it is flooded and we have to drain the water. Sergeant Shepard tells us that the Troggies are locked up in the shrine where the drain is. After defeating them, we drain the water and head to Finn. We defeat Finn, get the Jade Amulet, and head back to Captain Avery. He sends us to the docks to get a ship that he has generously gifted us. However, it's not exactly a ship, it's a raft. After confronting Avery about our raft, he says that he's stuck to his word and we got a ship. He points us in the direction of treasure. Captain Gunn was the richest pirate in history after discovering the delicacies of Yum. He has died and his wealth is missing with no one knowing where it was kept. Avery sends us to one of his associates who has found Gunn's last will, in return for us getting him the chalice which is in Gunn's treasure. Avery sends us to our trainer, and they send us to the Kraken Skulls Tavern. Inside the tavern, we meet Ratbed, who is wanting to lead the expedition. However, our contact won't allow that, as they are in charge. Ratbed steals the will and escapes to Blood Shoals. In Blood Shoals, we are met by Lasko, the first mate of Ratbed, whom Ratbed has poisoned. Lasko asks us to help the rest of Ratbed's now dead crew finish their unfinished business. In return, he will tell us Ratbed's plan to get Captain Gunn's treasure. Manny tells us before he was on Ratbed's crew, he sailed with a pirate named Zadok, who was in search of a lost city of gold, which happens to be in a passage inside Traitor's Cave. They went in and heard a roar. They ran back out, locking the door, leaving Zadok in there to fend for himself. He asks us to go and help Zadok to put him at ease. After meeting Zadok, we learn that the City of Gold is up above, and he needs two people to operate the winch. Zadok sends us up to the Aztecan outpost of Zol Akmal. The ancient Aztecasaurs built the city ages ago and entombed themselves in it, leaving the city to the jungle. Itzan Halak led a group of Aztecasaurs here recently to escape impending doom from the Queen of Shadows, which has been prophesized. However, there is an evil force within the city that has turned their warriors mad. After proving ourselves worthy, we speak with Itzam and he instructs us to get back the talisman and the crystal of Chanchich. With these, Itzam can hold back the forces while we head deep into the Chamber of Fire to defeat the Ancient One, Chokakob. We break the crystal in Chokakob's tomb and stop his dark power forever. We receive a small amount of gold from Itzam, which we share with Zadok. Zadok heads to the city, finding his peace and forgiving Manny for backstabbing him. Mo betrayed his true love, Wilhelmina, by stealing her mother's wedding ring and hiding it so she couldn't marry Captain Gordon. He asks us to return the ring to Wilhelmina. We find the ring in a chest in the Scarakid roost above the trader's cave. After finding the ring, we give it to Wilhelmina only to learn Captain Gordon has been kidnapped by the Red Claw gang. After getting information out of the Red Claws, we learn Gordon is held in Devilfish Hollow. We sail over to Devilfish Hollow, and we learn that Captain Gordon has been moved to the Red Claw hideout on Skull Island. In the hideout, we meet Buster, who is the leader of the Red Claws. He fights us for Captain Gordon. We manage to free Gordon from becoming soup, and Bonnie Ann pleads Parley. Parley allows us to do something for Buster in return for Gordon. Buster sends us to obtain the hook of the floating Dutchman. We head to Perdition's Cauldron and find the wreck of the Marie Celestia, the Dutchman's ship. Fighting our way through the Dutchman's undead crew, we finally make our way to the captain's quarters, where we meet and fight the Dutchman. After defeating the Dutchman, we return the Golden Hook to Buster and save Gordon. We reunite Wilhelmina and Gordon for Mo, and he gets forgiven and is now at peace. Jack was spying on Captain Avery for the cutthroats. He worries that Captain Avery is at risk. 
we head to the underwater grotto where Jack met the Cutthroats to try and find out what the plan is. The Cutthroats want Skull Island back and to get rid of Avery. We tell this to Avery and he doesn't believe us and sends us to Mordecai, the head of security. Mordecai has been sensing a revolt and tells us the best way to get in would be to go through Avery's escape tunnel. He sends us down to reinforce the guards. In the tunnels we meet Sergeant Seeger who has turned into a traitor. Sega and his boss escape to their rendezvous point. Mordecai sends us to Vadimir to get the spirits to help us find Sega. Vadimir senses Sega in the ancient tunnels underneath the island. We find Sega in a sealed off room. Sega tells us the cutthroats are working with the Threshers to take over Skull Island and the Skyway. We head over to Devilfish Hollow to meet with the Threshers, only to find out that they are not the ones behind it, but instead it is the prawns. The prawns are using dark hoodoo to transform themselves to look like sharks. The blessing we receive from Vadimir lets us see through this disguise. The prawns have convinced the sharks to give them the mightiest galleon and converted it into a fire ship to blow up Skull Island. We head to the fire ship and destroy it. We then head to the prawn hideout at the top of the mountain on Skull Island. In the hideout, we defeat an army of prawns and make it to their master. We stop the master, putting an end to the plot to destroy Skull Island. Mordecai thanks us for helping and says that Jack is forgiven. Lasko sends us to Jonatown in search of the black market mastermind, the Frogfather. Captain Ahab promises to help us, but first we need to help him. We rescue Brody, a fisher bird from a vortex of doom, and then we set out in search of Ahab's son, Norval, who has gone missing after a trade stop on Rapa Nui. We learn from the Nui that Norval was captured by pirates who sailed back to Skull Island. Blind Mew gives us information on the whereabouts of these pirates. They are located in the sewers underneath Skull Island. We head down and meet Beam who fights us. After his defeat, we rescue Norval and take him back to Captain Ahab. Captain Ahab sends us to Gullet, the belly of the whale Jonatown sits upon. In order to talk to the Frog Father, we have to get through his security first. We are given a passphrase by Rocco. However, the passphrase that we were given is one to determine us as gate crashers. We defeat Rocco and head through to the Frog Father with the new passphrase. The Frog Father runs his business on favors. You do something for him, he will do something for you. In order to get Ratbeard's whereabouts, we must storm the Presidio, a Monkeston fortress here in the Skull Island Skyway, and obtain the rare spices that are being stored there. We fight our way through the security of the Presidio, only to find that the spices are locked behind a key. We meet a member of our parents' crew, locked in a cell. They help us find the keys in return for their freedom. We defeat the captain of the fortress, get the keys, free our new crewmate, and get the spices. We head back to the frog father who is grateful for our help. However, he can't tell us where Ratbed is, as that would betray Ratbed. Instead, he transfers our favor to One-Eyed Jack, who is in Flotsam. Before we head off, the Frogfather mentions our parents ask for docking privileges at the starboard pier, and the ship is still there and insists we take it. With a new ship and a mission, we head to Flotsam. We arrive in Flotsam and find the tavern where we meet the Barkey, who says we only just miss Jack. He is heading to collect the rent in the flop house. Inside the flop house, we meet Mustang Sally, who is being haggled by Ratbed's crew for money. We help Sally, and she says she hasn't seen Jack today and sends us to Ned. Ned tells us that we are chasing a wild goose and that the barkeep is One-Eyed Jack. We head back to the tavern and tell him that he owes us a favor. He is delighted as the Frog Father's favors are generally difficult to repay. He says he had a deal with Ratbed to let him know if anyone came looking for him. While we were tracking down Jack, he let Ratbed know we were coming. We head to the cabin Jack was renting to Ratbed to try and catch up with him. He is burning Captain Gunn's will when we enter. He jumps out the window and makes an escape from Flotsam. The will is a long treasure hunt that first leads us to Gunn's refuge in Corsair Channel. We find another note inside his house, which leads us to their own lighthouse. We need to find the grave of Honest Ned, his first mate. We head deep into the Shady Hollow and come face to face with a witch doctor, Old Scratch, who controls the dead of the Shady Hollow. After his defeat, he joins our crew and helps us track down Ned's grave. The next note leads us to Bounty Island. Squinty, a crab pirate, has been searching the island for years trying to find the treasure. He believes it is not there. We participate in Gun's challenges around the island and head to his tomb underneath. Most of the treasure is missing. Old Scratch works his magic and gets Captain Gun to talk to us. He says Ratbed hired water moles to swim through the flooded tunnels and steal the gold. Gun then says that they are going to sacrifice it to their fire god, the Waponiwu Volcano. We climb up the volcano and come face to face with Chumbawumba, 
We defeat him, and he sacrifices himself into the volcano in shame. We free Ratbed, who is tied up, ready to be dropped into the volcano, and he tells us everything, and renounces his claim to the gold. We reluctantly take him into our crew, and we head back to Avery with the chalice he wanted. Captain Avery wants to turn Skull Island into a republic. He wants to get an imperial power to trade openly with Skull Island. It happens that the chalice is an heirloom of the Ortegos, who are a great Monkeeston family. He gives us the treaty and sends us to Puerto Mico, a Monkeeston outpost in the Tradewind Skyway. We head to the governor's mansion and speak to the Major Domo. He says that we are not dressed to see the governor and sends us to Bernardo, a tailor. We collect some silk off the ships in the Skyway and he gives us a suit. We head back and finally achieve audience with the governor. However, it's not Governor Ortega. He was deemed a traitor and locked in a dark hole. We instead have to deal with Governor Medina, who declines our trade proposal. The Majordomo says he may have a way to get a trade proposal. He sends us to Bishop Hildago. The bishop tells us about the Isle of Doom, an island with huge gold reserves. The Monkeestans need gold in order to keep a strong face among the other superpowers of the spiral. Gortez headed out on a mission to the island in search of gold. However, he became mad and now rules the jungle like a tyrant. The bishop wants us to head there, find Cortez, and bring him back. We collect some food supplies for the miners and set sail. Upon our arrival to the island, we are told that the water mole laborers are revolting against the Monkeestans. In order to stop the revolt, we need to defeat their leader, Haku. We head deep into the temple and defeat Haku and crush the rebellion. We then head deeper into the jungle, watching out for the troggies that live inside, and find a note carved into a rock. It was left by the last survivors of the now ruined outpost. They fled to a nearby cave and needed help. We meet up with the survivors who tell us one of them was caught by the Trogis and taken back to their village. We head into the cave where the Trogis are beginning to cook Criado alive. We rescue him and defeat the Trogis. He tells us a way to get through the bee swarms blocking the path is to make a paste that will drive them away. We collect the poison off the Trogi skin and the crimson lotus flowers around. We cover ourselves and walk through the jungle to find a ruined temple. We meet Hopper, a troggy who is on Gortez's size. We learn Gortez is fighting a war against the Armada Clockworks who have found themselves deep within the jungle. We head to the gate of the Gold Monkey Temple and are stopped by the guards. In order to get past, we must prove ourselves by destroying the Clockworks and the Captain. We head into the tunnels under the ruins and find the Clockwork Captain and destroy them. We are now allowed to see Gortez. We must continue our trials by defeating Ordez, a big water mole, ourselves without any help. We need to collect spider eggs for the townspeople. Finally, we must hear voices in the cave of many voices. We hear the voices of our parents, who say we must find them at their grave in the shining city of El Dorado. We meet Gortez, who is angry that we have come to take him back to the lands where he was treated so poorly while the oligarchs of Monquista profited from his success. We defeat Gortez and sail him back to Puerto Mico. We return to the governor again. However, this time it is Governor Durant, and she has no knowledge of our mission or trade treaty. Instead, she says we must take Gortez to Monquista to be tried by the royal court. The Major Domo gives us travel permits, and we head off to the world of Monquista. Upon reaching Monquista, we head straight to the throne room. Queen Isidore and King Fernando hear us and tell us to escort Gortez to Zender. They give us a letter and we set sail. When we arrive in Zender, we are told that all the prisoners need to enter through the back of the outpost. It's not until we talk with the warden that we are told that we are also prisoners and sent here to be executed. We fight off the warden with a little help from Gortez securing our freedom. We then learn about the opposition. This is a group of Monquistadors who are trying to overthrow the current government of Monquista, led by Queen Eleanor. She tells us to reach her sisters, who have a plan to take down the Holy Monquisition and the Crown. In return, she will secure a trade deal for Skull Island. We are instructed to head to St. Bonobo's Abbey to find Queen Anna. Anna says the plan starts with us splintering the noble houses to undermine the Crown's power. We head to the Summer Palace to find Queen Catherine. The Summer Palace is not an easy place to get inside. However, there is a passage through the sewers. After fighting our way through, we manage to talk to Catherine. However, she does not have great news. All her people have been captured by the Holy Monquisition and her scheme has been uncovered. She 
tells us that Zenda should be the new opposition hub and should be led by Queen Eleanor, but she cannot help us as it would draw attention to the opposition. While we were gone, Eleanor built up Zenda's stronghold and assigned Gortez as the general of the opposition. Eleanor says we should find a legendary artifact, the monkey's paw. This artifact should draw many of the noble families onto the side of the opposition. She sends us to talk with Monkey Hote, the Lord of La Mancha, who knows where the paw is. We are greeted by an interesting character, Don Quixote, and his assistant, Pancho. Pancho explains that the monkey paw is dangerous, and it is what turned his lord into a donkey. The monkey's paw is a sacred relic, the preserved hand of Saint Bonzo the Unfortunate. Bonzo was blessed by the first banana tree and performed miracles before his third and final death. After his passing, his hand was affixed to the end of a golden scepter, and it retains miraculous powers. Any monkeyston who holds it may make three wishes. However, if their soul is not pure, their wishes will only bring despair, much like what happened to Monkey Hote. Hote first wished for one million bananas. Secondly, he wished for more power to become a Don. He wanted to be called Don Quixote. However, he was instead transformed into a donkey named Don Quixote. To make matters worse, news spread that there were bananas all over La Mancha, and every lord in Monkeyster came to get their share, leaving Don Quixote a donkey and also bananaless. We are told the paw was stolen during the war that that was waged over the banana grab. We need to head to the library in Monquista City to find out exactly who had the paw at the end of the battle. Getting into Monquista City will not be easy as we are now an enemy to the crown. We head into the sewer system under the city, we fight our way through the spiders that have made their home in the system and make it to a hatch that leads up into the library. Once inside, we meet a librarian who knows who we are and offers to help us. All we need to do is put on a disguise and obtain the history book. In order to obtain the history book, we must deliver a book to Brother Tito. In return, he will give us his copy of the history book. After reading the book, we learn that it was the Valveda brothers who had the relic last. However, they went missing in Diablo Cut. We flee the city the way we came in and search for the brother's ship, the Cornelius. We arrive at Diablo Cut and see a marker telling anyone who reads it to turn back and not to enter the cut. This marker was placed to warn travelers searching for the monkey's paw away so they don't have the same fate as the Valveda brothers. We continue onwards and see the brother's ship. Upon entering, we find a very large carnivorous plant. After cutting down the plant, we can't find the paw. Old Scratch reanimates the nearby corpse of the Monquistador, asking for help. The Monquistador says all the survivors of the crash fled to the nearby cave and may still be there. Inside the cave, we need to obtain three keys in order to unlock the vault in which the paw is locked behind. However, to get to these keys, we have to fight the brother's crew. Once inside the vault, we meet the guardian of the paw. He says our final challenge is to pick out the poor amongst the decoys. After choosing the correct poor, we sail back to La Mancha. Don Quixote makes his final wish, one million bananas. We head back to Queen Eleanor and give her the poor. In return, she helps us secure a much needed trade alliance with the governor of Puerto Mico. The governor is not very helpful, but Major Domo sees the order from Queen Eleanor and sets up a trade alliance. The Majordomo gives us a letter that came for us whilst we were in Monquista. It's from One-Eyed Jack. He says that we are now in danger as we have hold of one of the maps that all of the pirates want. He tells us to meet him in the Scrimshaw. Before we could arrive, the wharf rats captured Jack and we must find him and save him. We learn that a rat named Nim has captured Jack in order to get to us. According to Jack, we have a piece of a treasure map that every pirate in Skull Island is after, and they are all hunting us down to get the map. We head to Avery to find out what's happening. He is glad that we succeeded our trade talks with Monquista. He then goes on to explain the map to El Dorado, a map leading to the City of Gold. Marco Polo made the map after his visit to the world with his legendary crew. Before he died, he split the map into seven and handed it to the crew members. Somehow, the chalice we got from Captain Gunn's treasure was wrapped in a part of the map. He offers us to find the map with his guidance and we can keep half the treasure. However, Finn has stolen the first piece from Avery. After heading to the cutthroat hideout, we learn that Finn is going to do a deal in the vortex next to the Presidio. Once we get into the vortex, we find Finn is about to give the map to Deacon, the spymaster of the Armada. After defeating the clockworks, we get the map piece and head back to Avery. Avery is shocked that Finn was going to give the map to the Armada as he didn't realize that the Armada was after the map. The Armada is Valencia's army that was built during the Polarian War. 
Kane, the leader, is a clockwork stronger, faster, better than any pirate. He wants to rebuild the spiral with no place for pirates. He has been excavating around Skull Island in places such as the jungle looking for El Dorado. Avery explains that we are now in a race for the map. The best place to start is to get Marco Polo's piece. He died in Valencia and that is where his map piece could be. However, getting to Valencia is not easy. Avery sends us to Hooktail, a pirate who can get us into Valencia. Hooktail says the only way into Valencia is via Avernus, a very deadly skyway of Dragonspire. We need to get an indigo windstone from the scurvy dogs in the Tradewind Skyway, and also travel papers from Queen Eleanor and Monquista. After obtaining these, we are told to find a unicorn named Steed, and he will help us. Steed tells us standing against the armada is foolish. However, after showing him the amulet Hooktail gave us, he warms to our idea. We tell Steed the armada is trying to get Marco Polo's map. Steed heads us in the direction of Surveyor, an academy that Polo taught at. However, walking into Surveyor is not easy. We will need a disguise. After collecting everything needed, Steed constructs our disguise. He tells us to meet a scholar named Thaddeus and ask to enter the library. Thaddeus tells us the academy is in chaos and the armada has ransacked the place in search of something. Thaddeus sends us to a historian who tells us about a secret entrance to the library. Once inside the library, we find all the books and papers about Marco Polo have been taken. We head into one of the armada fortresses at the end of the skyway and find a bunch of crates from Surveyor. However, there are no books inside. We grab the cargo manifest to try and work out what is going where, however it is written in a cipher. The historian sends us to the chief linguist of the academy so she can decipher the manifest. After breaking the cipher, we learn the books have been sent to Cadiz. Cadiz is the center of Kane's power, and sneaking in would be a very risky mission. Another scholar mentions that Polo kept records in Grankia. This is also where Polo's tomb is, underneath the chapel. Upon our arrival, we see that Amada is eating the island with a giant machine. We head into the tomb of Marco Polo and find a blue windstone, which we take for our ship. However, there is no map piece. Fool, one of the Armada elites, shows up to try and stop us. Fool says he had already taken the map piece weeks ago. We learn the Armada is watching us closely and are surprised to learn that we are not in Skull Island. Fool, whose loyalty to the Armada is very ambiguous, states that letting us free was a tempting proposition as we would be a massive thorn in the sight of Deacon, Bishop, or even Kane. However, he sends his captains to attack us. It is implied that Fool knows we will escape. As he leaves, he says we will meet again. We head back to Steed and he tells us to find a scholar in St. Bonobo's Abbey. The scholar says he spoke with Polo and that Polo said no one must ever go back as powers sleep in El Dorado that if woken could destroy the spiral. The scholar mentions the location of Polo's navigator, Christopher Clark, who lives in Cool Ranch, where Polo was born. The Cool Ranch Stormgate is located in Flotsam and that is where we sail to next. Upon our arrival to Cool Ranch, we meet Deputy Fowler who has just transferred to Cooper's Roost from Tumbleweed. He tells us to go to the Silver Spur Saloon to find Jane Canary, who will know where to find Clark. Jane says that Christopher Clark has died, but his son, Merriweather, still lives here. We head to his house only to find he is not there. A note on his door says to direct any inquiries to Dr. Elmore Coop. Dr. Coop was worried that Clark was not back from taking weather readings yet. He sends us to Junction in Arroyo Grande to find Clark at the weather station there. A professor in Junction tells us Merriweather has already left for Big Sky Country, but he was stopping in the Bison Burial Ground first. We hear a scream from a nearby cave in the Bison Burial Ground. Nurse Quinn is being attacked by Bison. We save her and she says Merriweather was taken prisoner by the Bison for stealing at the burial grounds. We head to Elder Bluff to free Merriweather. We talk to the Bison elders who say the claw feet want peace but their words are poison and that the spirits are angry. The only other way to appease the spirits that isn't to sacrifice Merriweather is to return the sacred charms that were stolen. Merriweather says he saw the Red Sash gang leaving the burial ground and suspects they have the sacred charms. We learn that the Red Sash Gang have a hideout in the Hidden Valley Ranch. 
we fight our way through the Red Sash members and collect the stolen bison charms and rescue a soldier named Corporal Sanders who has been captured by the gang. We return the charms to Seven Storms, one of the bison elders, and he thanks us. He says the next thing we must do is place the charms on the desecrated graves. After restoring the graves, Seven Storms sets Merriweather free. Merriweather says he has kept all the maps and charts his dad had However, they are back at his home in Cooper's Roost. We take him back home only to find Johnny Ringo, the leader of the Red Sash Gang, waiting for us. Merriweather said he swore to keep Marco Polo's map a secret as it was his father's dearest possession. Many people have asked Merriweather for the map. However, we are the first to save his life twice in one day. In return, he tells us the map is in a cave under Scorpion Rock. We head deep into the cave and find a chest guarded by the Scorpion Queen. After defeating the Scorpion Queen, we open the chest only to find a note. The note says, To the craven coward Christopher Clark, Marco Polo set to hide his precious map from me, but has failed. I have taken his ship, his gold, his map, and now I'll take El Dorado for good measure. Sincerely, Captain Blood. We head back to Merriweather and he says his father buried the map in order to keep it away from Captain Blood and we need to get it back at any cost. Captain Blood is an old pirate who apparently has a hidden lair in Cool Ranch. He died many years ago. Rumours say he was so evil even Death himself didn't want to take him. Both Bill Peacock and Desmond Argleston, two of Cool Ranch's greatest historians, don't know where Captain Blood's lair is. Desmond says the only person who may know is El Toro. Upon our arrival to Santa Polio, we meet Friar Cluck, who tells us about El Toro and his legacy in Cool Ranch. The Friar says perhaps Don Rodrigo knows the true identity of El Toro. Don says that he can call El Toro for us. However, we must first help the people of Santa Polio as El Toro would. We head to the church and see it was ransacked by banditos and El Toro had cleared them out. We gather sugar for the townspeople. Finally, we are asked to save a wedding. The first task is to locate the bride who was kidnapped by Frog of Vela. After the bride's rescue, we turn our attention to a strong box. The strong box holds all the family's money and was taken by El Guapo, the bandito boss. To find El Guapo, we head deep into the bandito gulch, their hidden fortress along the bandito trail. Once we arrive in Bandito Gulch, we start destroying the guard towers. We finally meet El Toro as we locate El Guapo. El Toro helps us fight El Guapo. Unfortunately, he escapes. El Toro says our attack was the perfect diversion for him to learn the true plan. El Guapo's boss, Santa Rana, has been getting the banditos to steal money from the people of Santa Pollo in order to get even more money off them than just the taxes. We give back the strong box, then head to Santa Rana's fortress, Castillo Sapo, to take down Santa Rana with El Toro. We split up with El Toro once we are inside the fortress. We head to the armory and find that Santa Rana has been working with the Armada. Suddenly, we hear El Toro and Santa Rana shouting at each other. Upon reaching their location, we surprise Santa Rana by helping El Toro and take him down. After making history by taking down Santa Rana, El Toro sends us to Don Rodrigo with a letter. However, Santa Rana barges into Don's home. We attack Santa Rana, forcing Don to reveal that he is El Toro and has been the whole time. Don tells us he doesn't know where Captain Blood's lair is. He was not the El Toro who defeated Captain Blood. It was his now dead adopted father. Don does say his father had a mentor, a bison named Tonka. In order to find Tonka, we must head to Eagle Caller in Bison Village. Eagle Caller is happy to help us since we helped his tribe settle their spirits. He says that Tonka is now teaming up with the Free Ranger. They have been captured by the Duck of Death, a duck who uses dark hoodoo to protect himself, making him invulnerable. The Duck of Death has badly injured Free Ranger and has taken Tonka hostage. We sail back to Bison Village in the hopes that the bison can cure the Free Ranger. We learn that a shadow is lying over the Free Ranger's spirit. We collect reagents from around Cool Ranch to try and break the shadow. However, he needs to rest and regain his strength. In order to learn how to stop the Duck of Death, we must consult with the totem spirits of Cool Ranch. They are currently unhappy and the bison tribes are to blame. Thunderbird, the mother of wind and storm, will only help us once all the spirits are at peace. The leader of the Black Storm Raiders, Three Scars, betrayed the bison and the totem spirits. He made packs with Brother Owl, Brother Wolf and Sister Snake and used their blessings for evil. We must put an end to the pact and bring the spirits on side. We start by talking to Brother Owl. We collect the flute from the Red Sash Gang and create a new rattle from the Tales of Stingtails. 
we learn an ancient summoning song and play it atop the hill at Gold Creek to summon Brother Al. Brother Al needs to make a new headdress since the last one was taken by three scars. We collect beads from the Blackstorm Raiders and the feathers from the last headdress from the Hornet Queen and Brother Al creates a new headdress for us to take to Raven Eyes. The next spirit to appease is Sister Snake. We find a perfect Sky Snake egg and offer it to her. Sister Snake gives us her venom and tells us to use it to defeat her abomination of a son who has grown wings. After the son's defeat, we bring back his broken fangs. Sister Snake agrees to be at peace with the bison. The next spirit is Brother Wolf. We collect striped buffaloon meat as an offering. He wants us to guide Silver Rain, who three scars killed with Sister Snake's venom, into the spirit world. We ask Sister Snake about a way to cure her venom. We need to collect a Garstier and a Grumwort herb. These are not easy to find. We head to Vadima back at Skull Island. She tells us we can get a Garstier from the Isle of Doom. Grumwort trade is regulated by the Frogfather. The Frogfather tells us he used to control the Grumwort trade until his business partner Joey Caro betrayed him and stole the Grumwort supply. We stop Joey and in return the Frogfather gives us some Grumwort. Sister Snake brews a balm that will cure her poison with the reagents. And we pour the balm into Silver Rain's grave, allowing her to move freely into the spirit world. Brother Wolf also wants us to defeat Three Scars and return the Bow of Chiefs to Raven Eyes. We enter the Blackstorm Vortex and take on three scars and return the bow to Raven Eyes. With the spirits at peace, we return to Thunderbird, who tells us the only way to stop the Duck of Death is with blessed silver bullets. We head to Cooper's Roost and talk with Bat Masterson, the foreman of the Silver Mine. The mine has been overrun with blood bats and we need to clear them in order to get any silver. With the mines now clear, Bat gives us some silver. We head to the blacksmith and forge some bullets. We return to Bison Village and pick up Free Ranger and head to Boot Hill. Luckily, there are basins of holy water there for us to bless our bullets. On top of Boot Hill, we meet the Duck of Death and the Armada Elite Deacon talking. We win the first fight, but the Duck of Death flees to his ship. It is on his ship where the Duck of Death finally meets his match, and we defeat him and free Tonka. Tonka tells us Deacon was wanting answers on the map and was going to use magic to call Don Rafael, the previous Altoro's ghost, who was buried in the tomb under the island. We head to the tomb only to find it is locked. We head back to Don Rodrigo and ask for the key, only for him to say it was stolen by Frogorales. After collecting the key, we head into the tombs. Old Scratch calls forth the spirits and they attack us. We collect some of Don Raphael's valuable possessions to offer in the summoning spell and Old Scratch works his mojo. Upon speaking to Don Raphael's spirit, we learn we must set his past wrongs right and let Don Rodrigo marry his daughter, Carolina. Tonka helped Carolina leave Cool Ranch to get to Skull Island, where she now goes by the name Mustang Sally. We first get Don Raphael's signet ring from the caves under Scorpion Rock. After collecting the ring, we head to Flotsam to find One-Eyed Jack, who is the only one who may know where Sally is. Jack says she was hired for a new job by Roscoe Ratso. He also warns us that the Monkeston royalty wants us dead for starting a civil war. Roscoe says he doesn't know who Sally is until Ratbed steps in and pulls the information out of him. He says Sally's boss is on the Monkeston flagship near the Monkeston Stormgate. Gingerly, we make our way to the Monkeston flagship, expecting the worst, only to find our friend Gortez, finding ways to win his civil war we helped start in Monkeston. The civil war is not going well. All the noble families have fallen short on their promises of help, but he has a plan to turn the tide of the war. Gortez hired Sally to break out a prisoner of Fort Elena an absolute beast of a prison in Port Regal Skyway, where Marleybone sends their most precious criminals. In order to get into the Port Regal Skyway, we need to befriend the scurvy dog privateers. The last time we were in the scurvy dog hideout, we stole the blue windstone. The dogs, now fearful of us, ask for a truce, and they send us to their captain, Dan. Dan says he is willing to help us since the Monkeestons want us dead. Sally has taken his only papers into Port Regal, but he knows another way and will tell us if we get fresh fruit from Monkeester. After gathering the fruit, Dan tells us there is a bounty out for Count Brastillo de Brass, better known as the Brass Monkey. He has destroyed many Malibone ships. If we capture the Brass Monkey and sail to the Port Regal blockade, we will be granted access to Port Regal. However, the Brass Monkey is very elusive. 
Captain Dan helps us find him after we clear the undead in the tunnels underneath the hideout. Dan says the best way to lure the brass monkey out is by destroying the Monkeston fleet. The brass monkey gets word of his fleet being destroyed and challenges us to ship to ship combat in the Antilles Maelstrom. After the capture of the brass monkey, we hand him over to the governor. We set off to find Sally's contact in Port Regal, Gilbert. Gilbert and his associate Sullivan run a smuggling company in Port Regal. In order to get their help, we first free their colleague Rackstraw, who was meant to take a very important delivery. We then go in search of the missing cargo, which has been stolen by a Valencian unicorn named Iago. We sail to Scrimshaw and get Iago's location from Nick Deadeye, the leader of the Wharf Rats. After fighting him, we learn that he is in the Maelstrom of Malice near Port Regal. With Iago's defeat and the return of the stolen goods, Gilbert and Sullivan tell us more about where Sally is. She has been captured while trying to break out a prisoner from Port Elena and is now in there as a prisoner. Gilbert and Sullivan say she was working with a pirate friend of theirs, Catbed. Catbed tells us Gortez's plan was to free Napoleon, the former emperor of Polaris. Napoleon is one of the greatest military geniuses in the spiral. He rebuilt the Polarian navy from the ground up and then started a war with Monquista, Marleybone, and Valencia all at once. The only stop to his rampage was when he was betrayed from the inside. Marleybone started a revolt inside Polaris and Valencia released the clockwork armada. Napoleon was captured and imprisoned in Fort Elena. Gortez wants to free Napoleon in order to win his civil war. Catbeard explains the only way to get into Fort Elena is to start a war between Marleybone and Valencia, something that is quite treasonous since Catbeard hails from Marleybone. We first start by riling up the Royal Navy ships. We then sneak into the governor's mansion and kidnap Mabel, his daughter. The next stage of the plan is to rile up the armada. We destroy their ships and then storm the clockwork dreadnought and blow it up. After all of that work, we managed to start a war between Marleybone and Valencia. While we were riling up the armada, Marleybone captured an armada leader and locked them in Fort Elena. Now the armada is bombarding Fort Elena. This is the perfect time to break into Fort Elena. We take the chance and sail to the prison. We blast our way into the prison and fight numerous guards to get to the cells of Sally and Napoleon. Just before we rescue Napoleon, we again meet with Fool who is releasing the armada leaders that had been captured. He says Deacon was expecting us to still be in Cool Ranch, and will be very displeased to know we are here. Napoleon demands before we set him free to get his most sacred possession, his hat. After retrieving his hat and freeing some of his penguins and his valet, we flee Fort Elena. When we return to Catbed, he tells us to return Mabel to the governor. The governor believes we freed her from the armada and thanks us. He also gives us a word of advice to watch out for the brass monkey, who has also escaped Fort Elena. We then return to Gortez. In return for his freedom, Napoleon says that if he can ever do us a favor, he will. Gortez and Napoleon then return to Monquista to continue their conquest in the Civil War. We take Sally back to Santa Poyo after giving her her father's signet ring. With the blessing of her father, Sally and Don Rodrigo get married. We head into the chapel in Santa Poyo and speak once again to the ghost of Don Rafael. He thanks us for putting him at peace and in return, offers us the name of one of Captain Blood's crew members who revolted against Captain Blood. He will know where the map is. Sly Winkum resides in Tumbleweed. We meet him in the tavern as he is about to get roughed up by the Wacko Kid, a member of the Wild Bunch gang. After saving Sly, we talk to him and say that El Toro has sent us. He says that Blood's lair is located in the Haunted Skyway, however it is blockaded by the Wild Bunch. Timmy, a kid, says that there is only one way to stop the Wild Bunch, and that is by reuniting the Magnificent Seven. The Seven were the greatest band of heroes and lawmen to ever sail the skyways. They were led by Wyatt Chirp, the greatest lawman Cool Ranch ever had. He recruited Wild Bill Peacock, who was the best shot with a rifle, Miss Jane Canary, who could bullseye a silver dollar at 50 yards, Duck Holiday, who looks death in his face and laughs, Buffalo Bill, who is stronger than an ox, Bat Masterson, who is a better tracker than a bloodhound, and finally, Billy the Kid, 
who was an outlaw until Wyatt showed him the error of his ways. In order to reunite them, we first talk to Duck Holiday, who lives here in Tumbleweed. After Wyatt's death, the seven parted ways and took their own path. Duck says it is very unlikely they will ever return. He says, perhaps we should try and convince Buffalo Bill, who hates Duck. If Bill will join, the rest will follow. Sly said Bill started a Wild Frontier show. He also says that the best way to get Bill to come back is to wager something in order for his return, as he is a betting man. We meet up with Bill and wager his return if we can fight his pugilist, Tyson, in solo combat. If we win, he will return to the Seven. We beat Tyson, and Bill says he will join again. We then head to Cooper's Roost, where Bill Peacock and Jane run the Silver Spur Tavern. We convince Jane to return, and she convinces Bill to come with her. Bat is the foreman of the Silver Mine under Cooper's Roost. We ask him to join, and he says that he will, as long as we can return the strong boxes that were stolen by the banditos in order to pay the miners. The only remaining member is Billy the Kid. He is imprisoned in the Frogger Rally compound on the bandito trail. We collect some dynamite from Bat's shipment on the docks, and set sail to the compound. We break in, defeating a number of the bandito captains in the process. After the successful recapture of Billy the Kid, we return to Tumbleweed. Duck and Buffalo Bill are waiting for us at the old chirp place, the Seven's home base. They all collect their badges, and we receive Wyatt's badge as a thanks for reuniting them all. Suddenly, the Wild Bunch show up. They attack us, but with the group back together, they stand no chance. We immediately start planning how to take down the Wild Bunch. We need to find Buck Bronco, the gang's leader. We fight Wild Bunch ships until we receive intel that Buck is hiding out in Arroyo Grande. We fight our way through his hideout and come face to face with him. After a long fight, we finally capture Buck. Upon our return to Tumbleweed, we learn that the town had been attacked by the Wild Bunch and kidnapped Timmy. They took Timmy to the old jailhouse. Upon arriving at the jailhouse, we split up, taking down the Bronco leaders one by one until we catch up with Old Man Bronco. After defeating Old Man Bronco, we free Timmy and return him safely to Tumbleweed. More importantly, we have completely destroyed the Wild Bunch, allowing us entry into the Haunted Skyway. As we are about to leave, we say goodbye to the Seven, and Timmy takes our place as their leader. We leave with one of the members joining our crew to continue to see battle. Sly tells us Captain Blood's lair is in the old Motherlode mine. However, it is locked behind a key that only Sabatini has. Sabatini was Blood's first mate, and the one who led the mutiny. He settled down in Fort McMurty. Colonel Church is in charge of the army in Fort McMurty. He asks us to take out some ghost ships and he can help us find Sabatini. He saw Sabatini fleeing the town a few weeks ago, and we'll try and find out more while we capture the prisoners who escaped a recent raid. We talk to the townsfolk and track down the first criminal, Weasley Jenkins, and return him to his cell. We head deep into the Haunted Skyway, into the Comanchero Vortex, where Crazy Horn, another escapee, is hiding out. We capture and return him. We then learn Captain Foote was the one to release the prisoners. He is hanging out in the Hangham Jail in the Dusty Vortex. We defeat Captain Foote and rescue Corporal Sanders for a second time. We return Captain Foote to the fort and we put him behind bars. Church has learned more about the location of Sabatini. He fled to the abandoned church. We reach the church just in time. Captain Blood is fighting Sabatini. Before he dies, Sabatini tells us to look to the cards and to head to the sisters on the Isla de los Muertos. Madame Esmeralda is waiting for us. We ask her where we can find the key to Captain Blood's lair. She pulls out her tarot cards and gives us a reading. She first pulls a reverse judgment card. She explained this means deceit, mutiny, betrayal. These are the obstacles we face now and must set them right. The second card is the Drowned Mariner. This is the challenge we face now and represents Captain Blood. The final card is the Death card. This is the solution to our problem. Captain Blood cheated death, and death is the only source of Blood's power. We feed the ravens nearby who explain to call death we must offer him someone to reap. We gather souls and head to the graveyard at the abandoned church where death is waiting for us. Death explains that on Blood's deathbed, he challenged death to a game of cards. In the final game, Blood upped the stakes and bet his immortal soul. Knowing that he would win, death agreed. Then Blood cheated. Death played his cards, but Blood went to the toilet and never came back. He took his cards with him. Blood is now stuck in a state of limbo. Death can't collect Blood's soul because death hasn't won the game. 
but he can't win the game because the game can't end because Blood has to play his cards by his own hand. Blood has the key, meaning we have to pry it from his dead hands, but he can't be killed. We hatch a plan with Sly to circumvent the rules. First, we need to find the cards. Then we need to find the hand that El Toro cut off and use the hand to play the cards and finish the game. We head to El Toro in Santa Pollo to find out what happened to Captain Blood's hand. El Toro says the hand was cut off in a fight at the lake in Gold Creek. He then joins our crew saying he wants to help take down Captain Blood once and for all. Mustang Sally stays to protect Santa Pollo. We dive deep into the lake at Gold Creek and find the hand. We return to Sly who says the cards are scattered around the town where the game was played, Miranda. We head to Miranda a town cursed by death. We fight our way through the ghosts and undead and find all the cards. We play Blood's cards with his hand that El Toro cut off and the game comes to an end with death winning. The only remaining task is for Captain Blood to die. We fight Blood and he is finally defeated and his torment is finally over. Before we leave, Sabatini is summoned by death to thank us for setting him and the townspeople of Miranda free. With the key, we head to the Motherlode Mine where Blood's lair is. We open the door and head inside. Once inside, we see the Santa Oro, Marco Polo's ship that he used to sail to El Dorado. The map piece must be somewhere on it. We blast our way through the tunnels and head down towards the treasure. Deacon catches us while we are looking for the map. We fight with Deacon and his Armada Generals, and we manage to defeat him. This is our first successful defeat of a member of Kane's Inner Circle. We gather the map piece and take Marco Pollo's ship. It is equipped with a green windstone, meaning we can set sail to the distant lands of Mushu. In the treasure pile, we also find a picture. It shows Marco Pollo's El Dorado crew which includes our mother, much to the surprise of us and our crew. We return to Argleston in Cooper's Roost for information on who the other crew members are. Unfortunately, he is unsure who the others are. There are also markings on the photo. He says he's unsure what they say, but they are of Mushu origin and suggests we head there to get them translated. We return to Avery in Skull Island with the news. We show Avery the photo, and he tells us the names of the other pirate, Erica the Red, Egg Fu Young, and Catbed, among others. Captain Avery sends us off to Mushu to get Egg Fu Young's piece of the map while he tries to get Catbed's piece. Egg is difficult to find. Avery suggests we start by talking to Zhu Ro in Hamamitsu. Zhu tells us Egg is a prisoner of the Yakuza. The Yakuza are a dangerous criminal gang in Mushu. We need to get into the Kotan Skyway. This is a lot harder than it should be as foreigners are not allowed to enter any skyways other than Hamamitsu. Zhu says he can help us if we get a statue from the wreckage out in the skyway. He needs the statue as a bribe to get a permit to sell noodles in his tea house. After bribing the magistrate, we are told to see Shirio Koji, who is with the Yakuza and can help us get into Kotan. In order for Shirio to help us, we must get a shipment of the Emperor's Gold from the trade ships on the Skyway. Shirio gets us to hide in a barrel in the back of his shop, and we get transported into the middle of the Yakuza hideout. We talk to the Oyabun, who tells us in order to talk to his prisoner, we must help the Yakuza. We learn that the Yakuza are not actually criminals, but are trying to help the poor and take out any who take from the poor. Our task is to head to Yagizawa village and steal the taxes back off the governor and give them back to the poor citizens. With the Empress sick, corruption has spread through the provinces of Mushu. We raid the governor's mansion and steal back the taxes and give them back to the citizens of Yagizawa. With the success of the mission, the Oyabun gives us an imperial writ allowing us to traverse through all the skyways in Mushu. The next task we have to complete for the Yakuza is to stop General So. General So is the warlord of the Kotan Skyway. He has stolen rice from the farmers of the Sujimura village and with winter coming, they will starve and die. We steal back the rice and return it to the farmers. This puts a big blow in So's war machine. The next part of the plan is to destroy General So's honor. So is sponsoring the wedding of one of his most loyal henchmen, Takeda Mumori. Our goal is to disrupt the wedding as much as possible. We need to get an invitation to the wedding. We steal a copy of the invitation and get the chief forger of the Yakuza to forge us an invite. We head into the wedding and steal General So's gift. We then deface the walls of the mansion with words so foul our crew don't even want to say them out loud. We then get onto the stage where the entertainment for the night is scheduled and destroy all the props. On our exit from the wedding, we fight a very large group of General So's men. We return to the Yakuza hideout only to find Egg Fu Young is free. He says he was the leader of the Yakuza the whole time. 
and only says he's a prisoner to see if he can trust us. He says he will give us the map piece if we can defeat General So once and for all. However, if we just defeat him, he will be seen as a hero. We must expose him for the traitor he is. So has been working with the Inoshishi to raid and pillage the towns of Kotam. We defeat the Inoshishi chief and he gives us a letter with his orders from General So, which leads us to the Inoshishi clan hideout. We head in and defeat the clan lord of the Inoshishi. He is protected by a door sealed with bad mojo. We have to obtain the earth, wind, and fire talismans in order to open the door. On his defeat, the clan lord says that we need to tell the mayor that the Inoshishi have already won. The mayor says the Inoshishi have stolen all the boats and are heading to Yamakai, where the great sage is. Wanmo, the great sage, tells us the story of how Malastia stole the Dragonspire world key from the Emperor. Since the Emperor has been cursed, war has raged throughout Mushu in order to consolidate power. Unfortunately, before he can finish the story, he is killed by ninja pigs. We head into the ninja pig lair and find a note with their targets, written by Dr. No. The next name on the list is the Mayor. We save the Mayor and set our targets to Dr. No, General So's right-hand man. Dr. No is hidden in the nearby Typhoon Vortex. We fight him, capture him, and bring him to Egg. Dr. No apologizes to Egg for stealing his map piece and says it is with General So, who is about to trade it to the Armada for guns and gold. With this shocking revelation, Egg sends us to General So's fortress. We enter the fortress, only to find getting to So will be harder than we thought. We need to get the army to open the gates to the inner fortress. To do this, we blow up the powder stores where General So is keeping the gunpowder he got from the armada. So's army rushes out of the gates to try and stop us. We fight our way through and make it to So's inner sanctum. This is where we meet Rook the Grand Marshal of the Armada. Rook has the piece of the map and tells us he has urgent business in Marleybone to attend to and calls General So to defeat us. Unfortunately, we use General So's weakness against him. We threaten his prized chicken, making So surrender. General So says no one in Kotan can translate the map, so the Armada must have gone somewhere else to get it translated. The governor of Hamamitsu says the only way for the Armada to translate the map is by using the Scroll of Secrets. The scroll is kept in the Library of Contemplation in Subata. We are given a pass to access Subata and head to the Subata Temple. Lord Chagatai, who rules over the temple, says he will help us if we prove our loyalty to Mushu. Once we've proven our loyalty, he sends us to the librarian Quan Shi. We learn from Quan that the scroll had already been taken out. Our only hope is Shuzan the Wise. Shanzang is in the Temple of Eternal Serenity. He says there is only one person who can translate the map, and that is Kao Tzu father of Kaoism. Kao wrote the Scroll of Secrets. Marco Polio studied the scroll and used it to build his map. Kao lives at the Celestial Shrine, which is atop the Great Turtle, Maruzame. The way to summon Great Turtle is by throwing five turtle balls into the Eye of Harmony. The keepers of the turtle balls are Monkey King, Pigsy, Friar Sand, Dragon Prince, and Shanzang. All except Shanzang guard the temples of the Four Winds. Our first ball comes from Monkey King. He is trapped under a mountain that got placed on him for causing chaos. He says he will give us the ball if we free him. Monkey King says the cage was designed by a weaponsmith named Hanzo. We gather some moon pollen to spike his tea in order to get the key to the cage. However, he does not drink the tea and instead tells us there is no key and the lock was only made to taunt Monkey King. Monkey King's next plan is bash the cell open with his staff. His staff was taken by the Dragon King. Dragon King says he will give the staff back if we fetch the Jade Egg Monkey King stole. We head to the Valley of the Titans in order to get the egg. We meet the monks of the White Lotus who are terrified of the Stormzilla stomping their towns. The leader of the White Lotus tells us there is an ancient robotic suit, the Stupendor X, and that we are prophesied to use it to take down the Stormzilla. We hop in the suit and fight the Stormzilla, taking it down. During the fight, the Stormzilla broke the wall surrounding the Jade Egg. We sneak in and take it from the Tengu. We return the Jade Egg to the Dragon King and he gives us the Golden Staff. Upon returning the Staff to Monkey King, he breaks free and then says goodbye without giving us his Turtle Ball. We return to Shenzang who saw this coming. He says, there is only one way to control Monkey King, the Crown of Command. With the crown, we need to put it in his armor that he will reclaim. We head to the Shadow Fortress to slip the crown into the armor. In our way, a ninja picks. We defeat them and their leader Kurigi and head to the Treasury. In the treasury is Monkey King's armor, 
where we sneakily place the crown in the helmet so he won't notice it. We return to Shunzang, who teaches us the words just in time as Monkey King runs into the temple. We say the words and Monkey King is now under our control and becomes one of our crew members. Monkey King says that he doesn't have his turtle ball anymore and he gave it to someone as he was running from us. We head to the nearby vortex and find it to be the brass monkey. After his defeat, we gather the first of five turtle balls. Our next ball comes from Pigsy in the Temple of the North Wind. In order to get to the temple, we need to clear the thick fog. We talk to the nearby monks who have been ravaged by the Amber Horde. In return for helping get their sacred statues back, we get a blessing placed on us so that we can walk through the fog and still know where we are going. Pigsy says he sent his ball away when the temple was attacked by the Amber Horde. However, the Amber Horde took the ball after defeating the courier. After collecting the ball from the Amber Horde, we head off to find Friar Sand in the Temple of the East Wind. We make a quick stop in Raven Isle to get the Pearl of Winter. At the Temple of the East Wind, Friar Sand says the only way we can get the Turtle Ball is if we defeat him. Friar Sand is invincible when on water. With the Pearl of Winter, we can make the water ice, making Friar Sand take damage so that we can defeat him and to claim the Turtle Ball. We head to the Temple of the West Wind and speak to the Dragon Prince. To get the Turtle Ball from the Dragon Prince, we need to recover the stolen artifact from the White Lotus Monks. The Monks ask us to stop fighting them as they are peaceful and have not stolen anything. We learn that Dragon Prince was transformed into a Wind Horse by Lopan. We return and expose Lopan for taking the form of the Dragon Prince and fight him. With Lopan defeated, we next take to lifting the curse off the Dragon Prince. We need to summon a Kirin to do this. We offer laurel leaves, play the harp of harmony, and blow the alabaster horn at the cloud shrine. After lifting the curse on Dragon Prince, he happily gives us his turtle ball. That brings our total to four of the five balls needed. The last ball is Shunzang's. He lost his at the Hamakala Temple, a very ancient evil temple. We head to the temple and defeat the guardians and recover the final turtle ball. We head to the Eye of Harmony and throw the turtle balls in to summon Maruzame. Once we climb on Maruzame, we must pass the tests and defeat the guardians in order to talk to Kaozu. We defeat the Wood Guardian, the Fire Guardian, the Earth Guardian, the Metal Guardian, and finally the Water Guardian. After passing the tests, we finally meet Kao Tzu. Kao says he spent a long time with Polo working on the map to Shangri-La, or as Polo called it, El Dorado. He says that the Armada has two pieces to the map and so do we. He teaches us how to decipher the map and we head back to Captain Avery to see if he managed to get Catbed's piece. While we were gone, Avery had no success finding Catbed, so we take matters into our own hands. We head to Catbed's lair in Port Regal. Mr. Norrington, Catbed's first mate, meets us and says Catbed is in trouble. He was ordered to be an enemy of the crown and was taken to Marleybone when he was restocking supplies in Port Regal. To get into Marleybone, we need a yellow windstone. There is a spare windstone in the basement of Fort Bassett. Fort Bassett has been locked up tight since the war begun. We talk to Lytton, a reformed thief, and he says he will help us if we get the vicar of Port Regal to marry him and his fiancée. We clear the church from the ghost of Captain Kidd and Governor Shrewsbury, who are feuding over who the Faith of the Heart of the Inkal was, and the father agrees to marry Lytton and his fiancée. Lytton gives us the key to the cellar of Fort Bassett, which we can access from the sewers. We head straight for the commander's office, where the windstone is kept fighting waves of red coats and Marleybone commanders. We grab the windstone from the safe and flee the fort. We need to acquire travel papers to get into Marleybone. We head back to Mushu to talk with the Marleybone ambassador there. The ambassador says Mushu has shut down their skyways to make them neutral. They are not trying to get involved in the Marleybone Valencia war. The ambassador says the only way we are getting help from her is if we use our connections in the Yakuza to get a tea trade between the Yakuza and Marleybone started. Egg Fu Young says the only way he is opening a trade with foreigners is if we take out the threat to his leadership, Sato. We head to Sato's hideout and defeat large waves of his followers and finally meet him face to face. After his defeat, Egg happily opens up a tea trade with Marleybone. We get the travel papers and sail into the dark, war-ridden Westminster Skyway. The war is not going well for Marleybone. Valencia seems to be a mere few days from taking victory over Marleybone. If Marleybone falls, this would be a devastating loss to the spiral and the massive gain to Kane's power. When we started the war with Catbed, he thought Marleybone would be able to hold off Valencia, but he was very wrong. We head to Catbed's lawyer, Swidget, 
who says speaking to Catbeard is impossible. He says that he will try and help us get to talk to Catbeard if we convince his nephew to leave the gang of radical foxes that he has gotten into. We storm the red fox's lair and defeat some of the foxes, scaring Swidget's nephew into leaving the gang. Swidget manages to sneak us through the security claiming we are experts in the statues of Fort Regal law. We make it to Catbeard's cell and he is thankful we have come. He tells us we must get him out of here and he will tell us where his map piece is safely kept. Swidget explains that emergency laws have been passed that allow criminal sailors to be released on parole into the custody of a Royal Navy captain. None of the current captains want Catbeard in their crew for obvious reasons. However, another law has been passed that allows civilian captains to rise the ranks and become Royal Navy captains, meaning that we can become an honorary Royal Navy captain and take custody of Catbeard. In order to get enlisted into the Royal Navy, we must prove ourselves to the commanders. Our first mission is to disable an Armada fortress in the Skyway. We storm the fortress and blow up the hold. Our second task is to destroy a massive armoured station that the Clockworks have sailed into the Skyway. The station has massive guns that would obliterate Marleybone City. It's a suicide mission, but if we do it, we will become Royal Navy Captain. Before we set sail, we head to the docks and talk to Gracie Conrad, an engineer who has a supply of Jalignite. Jalignite is a highly explosive substance used to destroy the station. She joins our crew and sails with us to the station beachhead. Beachhead is broken up into spokes where the three massive guns are located. We enter the first spoke and destroy the Armada soldiers guarding the area and ignite the Jalignite destroying the gun. We head down where they store the ammunition and destroy it all. We head into the second spoke. Again, it is heavily guarded. We disable the gun with the Jalignite and then head down below the main deck to find a workshop. There is a golden wheel similar to the ones we saw in the Isle of Doom and a weird device that captures moving images and plays them back. The most recent message is from Bishop, Kane's mad tinkerer. The message is a recap of the progress report on the war. Bishop explains that the war is going to plan and he projects Marleybone's surrender within a week. Their next steps is a full naval assault on the Isle of Fetch, the last bastion of Marleybonian defense. Step two, Rook will use the treaty with Mushu to launch a new massive attack into Marleybone from Hamamitsu, not Valencia. With the Royal Navy focusing on the Isle of Fetch, this attack will take Marleybone by surprise. The final step is to use the station's cannons to bombard Marleybone City and put Marleybone into submission in a matter of days. The message finishes with a more personal message from Bishop. He says he wants to return his full attention to the grand design. He mentions clockwork birds that a toy maker has made and sent out into the skyways of Marleybone and Valencia. They have inscriptions on them which Bishop has recognized as Aquilin Linear B, but he does not know what they mean or why the toy maker has sent them into the skyways. Suddenly, Bishop bursts into the room and orders his guards to take care of us and calls for help. We escape and head to the final spoke. In the final spoke, we are again confronted by guards. We sabotage the final gun and Bishop again shows his face. This time he recognizes who we are, the pirate who destroyed Deacon and runs off to notify Kane. Our next step is to disable the main battery of the station. We head in the elevator to the main battery. We are once again stopped by Bishop. This time he fights us. The fight doesn't last long and Bishop flees. Before he fled, he said that Beachhead is the pinnacle of Armada engineering and is indestructible. After taking a look at the main battery, Gracie agrees, saying that even all the Jalignite we brought would not be enough to destroy the station. However, Gracie notes that the hydraulics the station uses are run on a very volatile fluid, but they don't have a pressure compensator. This essentially means if we can put enough pressure into the system, the whole station is going to explode. Gracie says the way to do this is by tripping the fuses that control the pistons, making them jam. We flick the switches while fighting our way through the clockworks. Before we can flick the last switch, Bishop once again tries to stop us. This time, we defeat him and he runs to evacuate the station. We flick the final switch and run out. We make it to our ship as Beachhead explodes. We return to the Admirals and they are very pleased with our work on Beachhead. We give them the information about the planned attack from Rook and Admiral Nelson goes and tries to stop the assault. The Admirals have lost contact with the Isle of Fetch. The Kyrgyz from their colony Raj are currently defending Fetch. However, they are complaining about their rations. The Isle of Fetch is a mess. The dogs and the Kyrgyz are fighting each other. 
The Kogas have kidnapped a chief brigadier. We find the leader of the Kogas and he explains that the food is too good to be eaten by warriors. He wants his warriors to be hungry and irritable in order to get the best results. He wants the warriors to be hungry for battle, not for rations. We head to the supplier and he gives us a list of ingredients to get for Marlemite, a very foul delicacy of Marleybone. Once we return all the ingredients, we deliver Marlemite to the Kurgas. They approve of how terrible Marlemite is. This is just in time as the clockworks have launched their invasion of Fetch. We head down to the Armada landing and halt their invasion. We return back to the Admirals and they send us to the army. We need to figure out where the supply holdup is for the War Golems. The War Golems are Marleybone's answer to the clockworks. The Fox Anarchists have taken the parts needed for the Golems. Once the supply chain issues have been sorted out, we return to the Colonel of the army and he sends us back to the Admirals. Nelson managed to surprise Rook as he entered via the Mushu storm gate and destroyed most of the Armada's fleet. He then lured Rook's flagship into the Trafalgar Vortex. We need to go there as backup, as we are one of the only captains left. Nelson rammed the flagship with his and only a wreckage remains. We board and fight our way to Nelson. After saving Nelson, we come face to face with Rook. Rook knows of what we did to Bishop and Beachhead and wants vengeance. We fight him and defeat him. He runs off to another part of the wreckage. Nelson says we came at just the right time. However, he needs a ride for him and his crew back to the Isle of Dogs as his ship is completely destroyed. While making our escape, we come face to face with Rook once more. This time, we put a final blow into Rook and he is defeated once and for all. We sail back victoriously to the other admirals and report that Rook has been defeated. In thanks for our help, Nelson grants us the commission and we become an honorary Royal Navy Captain. With our new rank, we head straight to the Glasshouse Prison, just in time as Catbed's trial has already begun. We inform Swidget that we have gained the commission and we will be willing to take Catbed. During the final statements of the trial, Swidget waves his right to a closing argument, much to the displeasure of Catbed. The judge goes on to say that he has never seen someone more deserving of the full penalty of law. Just before the judge makes his decision, Swidget chimes in and saying that sentencing Catbed would be a terrible military mistake. He goes on to say every ship captain is needed, and Catbed is a very capable captain. He then says that we are willing to take on Catbed on parole, and states that even if he is on parole, his chance of surviving is practically nothing, meaning it is an essential death sentence. The judge agrees and Catbed is released and now joins our crew. Catbed tells us he no longer has his map piece as he lost it in a bet with Captain Gunn. This means we had his piece the whole time. To make up for this, he sets us on the course of Aquila to find Argos, the helmsman of Marco Polo's ship. He says the quickest way to Aquila is through Monquista, and we should have no problem getting through as Gortez won the civil war and is now king of Monquista. Gortez gives us the papers required to travel to Aquila and we set sail. Catbed has an old friend called Autocules who can help us find Argos. However, he doesn't know where Argos is as he vanished a few weeks ago. Our only hope in finding Argos is to consult the Oracle. We collect an offering to speak to the Oracle. She says Argos stands in a deep darkness and she cannot see him without the mirror of Apollo. To see through the mirror, her basin must be filled with the sacred water of Oceanus. However, the Aphidians stole the water and are keeping it in their fortress in Ilios. We arrive in Ilios and speak to Eglamemnon, the greatest of Aquilan generals. He says the Oracle's water is kept in the city of Troy, an unbreakable Aphidian city. The only way we are getting into Troy is with the help of Aegilles the king of Sparta. Aegilius only agrees to help us after we throw him an extravagant party that involves food, wine, and poetry. With Aegilius' return to the war, we now must find a way to breach the walls of Troy. We come up with a way to lure the snakes out of Troy with a giant mouse statue. The eagle troops will be inside the mouse and sneak out once the mouse is inside the city. We talk to the best architect in Aquila and he designs the mouse. We build it and climb in and storm the city. We open the gate to let the rest of the eagle warriors in and head to the palace. We defeat Sargon the Great and retrieve the sacred water for the oracle. With the oracle's vision returned, she sees Argos standing guard at a set of mighty doors, holding them shut with all his might. However, she can't tell where the doors are. Instead, she sends us to the Serpent Seers. The Serpent Seers charge us with the memory of our first five years of childhood for one answer. These five years are the only memory we have of our parents. Our companions who knew our parents say they will fill in the gaps and remind us of our parents. The Serpent Seers 
answer the question with another question. They ask, where is Theseus? We head back to Nova Aquila looking for Theseus. Theseus was tasked with recapturing the Minotaur and locking it away in the labyrinth. Theseus has not returned since. We get a spare key to the labyrinth and head off to the island of Gnosis where the labyrinth is. The island of Gnosis is overrun by vultures and after clearing our way through, we head into the hall of Minos, the entrance to the labyrinth which is below the halls. After a few fights with the vultures, we make it to the great doors and find Argos standing there holding them shut. Argos will give us his piece of the map if we find someone to hold the doors. The strongest person in Aquila is Hercules, son of Zeus. He is the only one strong enough to replace Argos. To find where Hercules is, we become a citizen and talk to the Emperor. However, the Emperor doesn't know where Hercules is. He sentenced Hercules to 10 labors to atone for his late his troublemaking, but he only finished five before he left Nova Aquila. One of the poets says Hercules went in search of his missing belt he got from his father, Zeus and is on the island of Talos looking for it. We defeat the Colossi on the island and retrieve the belt with Hercules. We return to Argos with Hercules. We need to enter the labyrinth and find Theseus. However, Hercules doesn't want to hold the door and instead wants to fight. Argos agrees and we enter the labyrinth with Hercules. We traverse our way through the maze thanks to Gracie's navigation system she came up with and save Theseus. On our escape, we fight the lesser minotaurs, and we escape and reunite Argos and Theseus. We next need to find a chain tough enough to hold the doors. The only chain strong enough is the one that binds the Hydra. The Oracle says the only way to defeat the Hydra is if its ebon head is defeated. Then we must burn its coils using only the sacred flame of Golden Apollo. We defeat the Ophidium flame dancers to prove we are worthy of the flame of Apollo. We receive the flame and head to the Hydra. We defeat the Hydra and burn the coils and retrieve the chain. We place the chain over the gates of the labyrinth and seal them once and for all. Argos thanks us and tells us to take him to his home in Inoculum. Hercules joins our crew to make sure that the great poets will always speak fondly of his travels. Ulysses raided Argos' home and took his chest where his piece of the map was stored. We learn from Ulysses' marooned crew that he was bound for Ithaca. We head to the Isle of Anthemusa where the sirens live. We collect a potion for the sirens so that we can hear them without going crazy, and they say that Ulysses sailed past heading straight for the Dread Passage. Inside the passage is the mighty Scylla. We defeat the four heads of the Scylla, and the way to Ithaca opens. Ulysses' home on Ithaca has been overrun. We find him hiding in a cave on the island, plotting a way to take back his home. Ulysses says that he took Argos's chest because he believed him to be dead. He will happily give it to us if we take back his home from the invaders. We obtain his bow, which he lost after the siege of Troy from the Medusa. With his bow, we head into his home and defeat the invaders. Ulysses gives us Argos's piece of the map, and we find a strange stone tablet that we ask to take. The markings on the tablet are the same markings as on the clockwork birds that Bishop was saying had been let into the Valencia and Marleybone skyways. The tablet is a Rosetta stone, which once stood in the port of Rosetta in Crocotopia at the height of its empire. The inscription praises Emperor Squawcus Maximus in three languages, Old Aquilin, New Aquilin, and Crocotopian. We head back to Marleybone so they can translate the symbols on the clockwork birds. We talk to Mycroft Bone, who is the head of the royal intelligence. The stone is just what he needs to translate Aquilin Linear B so that his team can read the inscriptions. The inscriptions, however, are also encoded in the cipher. Mycroft doesn't want to send it to the cryptography branch as that would take weeks for them to crack and says that there are only two minds good enough to break it. Firstly is his brother, Sherlock Bones. Unfortunately, he is busy dealing with the fallout of the business surrounding the Croconomicon and is unavailable to decode the message. The second is a criminal named Miao Yari, who is locked up tight in the glass house. Mycroft gives us a letter which allows us access to speak with Miao Yadi. We give Miao Yadi the message to decipher. He says it's a verse of classical Aquilum poetry, but some of the words are wrong. He says it is designed to foil a machine. He uses the wrong words and gets a message that reads, I know how to defeat Cain. Find me in Valencia. Seek Cagliostro. G. We return to Mycroft. He releases us from the navy and transfers us to his special branch. He tells us our mission is to find G, infiltrate Valencia, and take down Kane. 
Avery says our best bet is to seek out Count Cagliostro. Cagliostro lives in high society in Valencia, meaning we will have to travel to the capital. Avery says all the ways to Valencia are blocked because of the war, and our best bet is to return through Avernus. We sail to Monquista to see our friend Gortez. Gortez suggests we head to Valencia through the front door with complete diplomatic immunity. Gortez tells us to take his best diplomat, Don Armando, who will be attending diplomatic discussions in Valencia City. We head through the storm gate to Valencia in Hamametsu and enter the wondrous heart of Valencia, the Calibria Skyway. We must get an audience with King Casimir, the King of Valencia. However, we came too late and our slot has passed. We must take someone else's slot. We speak to a unicorn duke, who is next in line to speak to the king, and he says that if we solve his problem, he will give us his slot. We head to the Luchi Villa to obtain the profits the Duke is missing. We retrieve the money and give it to the Duke, who in return offers us his audience with the king. We enter the throne room of King Casimir. Cain is standing behind the king, suggesting to him that we should be taken care of. He sets his guards of battle angels on us. We take them down, protecting Don Armando. The king asks us why we bring violence into the throne room. Don says Cain must be mistaken as we are a gallant ship captain who is no menace and reminds Cain that as we are a diplomatic attaché, we have complete immunity and further proceeds saying that we are a dear friend of His Excellency King Cortez and have given great service to the realm of Monquista. King Casimir dismisses Cain, warning him not to insult the diplomats. The king suggests the discussions with Monquista should continue later. Don Armando agrees and says that we will not be attending next time in order to not offend Cain. We take Don to the diplomatic quarters and meet Landino, a member of the resistance. Landino explains that we were the ones to rekindle the resistance since our last adventure into Valencia. He explains how Cain came to power after the Napoleonic Wars. Cain was given the command of all trade during the wars and still maintains hold of it today. He destroyed all the merchant companies and they were the ones to start the resistance. However, the resistance strike too soon and got defeated by the Armada. Cain rebuilt Valencia City into a clockwork city, relocating the guinea pig workers into ghettos underground. Cain allied himself with the criminal crustacean families and they are now working as his secret forces. But now the resistance is forming again and is learning from the mistakes of the past, striking this time in the shadows. We say we are looking for Cagliostro. Landino says, that is a very dangerous name, and Kane has his eyes very closely on him. Kane's enforcer, Commander Typhoon, follows Cagliostro everywhere he goes. We notice a letter in the quarters that was left not by any resistance member. We read it, and it is from Cagliostro. He tells us he can help us. We need to find him in the Manicotti Atrium. Landino says it might be a trap, as the Manicotti are a sinister crab clan. Contessa, another resistance member, joins our crew, saying she will help us and lead us to the atrium. We head into the sewer in search of the Manicotti atrium. Inside we find Cagliostro, who is held up by the Manicotti. Cagliostro tells us that the G we are seeking is Gaspacho, who is the one who built Cain. He is locked away somewhere as Cain's prisoner. He says in order to find Gaspacho, we must find the inner circle of the resistance. We can start by seeking Desdemona, the daughter of Count Brabanzio. Commander Typhoon bounds in to protect Cagliostro. We fight and defeat the commander. We head back to Landino, hoping he will be able to help find Desdemona. We learn from the Valencian elites that Desdemona is confined to the Brabanzio Villa. We trick the guard and enter the villa and meet Desdemona. Desdemona says she will help us if we stop her true love, Branzino, getting sentenced for being a resistance spy. She has evidence that proves his innocence. We head to the court, however, the time for new evidence has passed. We obtain a marble statue from Aquila, we gift it to the legate, and he sets Bacino free. Desdemona says we need to speak to, to Don Giovanni at the Trigant Villa and give his servants the password Traviata. Giovanni is joined by Steed, who we met on our first expedition to Valencia. They say Gaspacho is being held in the clockworks, where the Armada soldiers are made. Steed sends us to Nobartanello, who is the one that receives the messages from Gaspacho to see if he knew a way inside the clockworks. Nobartanello says Gaspacho is kept in a tall tower 
near the rear of the factory, but the only way in is with a key. He heard the Rigatoni clan stole the master key as they were planning to raid the clockworks and rob the Tortellini. While we're collecting the key, he found the architectural plans of the clockworks that we can use to find our way around. We say farewell to Don Armando and sail into the clockworks. Upon our entry to the clockworks, we are swarmed by Armada guards and Tortellini thugs. We head to the tower and meet Gaspacho. He tells us he has been a toy maker all his life. He wanted to become rich and that was his undoing. The Tortellini family invested in his toy making and asked him to make more practical devices. He started making automata machines shaped like men. They didn't require food or wages and the wealthy paid handsomely for them. After he made the Tortellini rich, they exiled him from Valencia. He forged a plan for revenge in his hidden workshop. He was determined to build a new clockwork with a true mind and will. After years, the machine was made. The machine was named Cain. However, since Cain was made to take revenge on the Tortellini, the dark purpose was reflected in Cain's dark soul. After learning everything, Cain returned to Valencia and instead of destroying the Tortellini, he began creating his own clockworks. Cain sent Deacon and Rook after Gaspacho and trapped him in this tower ever since. Now Cain has as much power as the king and there isn't anything anyone can do to stop him. We start our escape from the clockworks. We make one stop to Gaspacho's old residence where he collects a small machine he collected in El Dorado. To the surprise of everyone but Catbeard, we learn Gaspacho was on the expedition to El Dorado. The reason we didn't see him in the photograph of the crew we got in Cool Ranch is because he was the one who took the photo. Gaspacho, much to Catbeard's dislike, tells us the story of El Dorado, a secret the crew swore they would never tell to anyone. Gaspacho begins to explain the reason Kane is different begins in El Dorado. El Dorado was a dead city with terrible mechanical sentinels made of gold that roamed the lands. They caught the crew by surprise and decimated the crew in an instant. Only a few survived. As they cast off from the dock, one of them boarded the ship. They managed to destroy the machine only just. While the rest of the crew argued over the gold, Gaspacho claimed the broken pieces of the machine as his share of the treasure. He learned a lot dismantling the parts he collected, however, there were two parts he could not disassemble. The function of them eludes him to this day. He kept them hidden, and they are his greatest treasures. He pulled the pieces from the head and the chest of the golem, and named them the mind and the heart. After studying for decades, he put one of the mechanisms to use. The golden mind sits behind Kane's mask. Gaspacho says his plan is to insert the heart into Cain and turn his will good. Our next stop is the heart of Cain's machine where Cain resides. We fight through more guards and escape the clockworks and sail into the belly of the beast, the great machine. Outside the machine, we once again meet Fool. He says he can help us break in and he has been waiting for our arrival. Fool notices Gaspacho and asks what he's doing here. Gaspacho says he's here to redeem Cain. Fool says it's an impossible task, but says it's not our only worry. He says that this machine is designed to destroy the spiral and rebuild a first world, a world that will be perfect. We also learn why Fool has been so accommodating to us during our encounters. He says that he was Cain's first attempt at building a clockwork, and he's not exactly the most perfect clockwork. Some would describe Kane's work as a failure. Fool says the only way to save himself is by letting us destroy Kane. He says he has grown fond of us and of this world, but more importantly, he is just curious to see what happens. He lets us inside the machine and we ride the elevator to the top. At the top of the elevator, we meet Kane, who quickly shoots and destroys the clockwork heart and savagely kills Gaspacho. Kane says he was expecting us to come, however, he was not expecting us to bring Gaspacho or the heart. He continues on by saying the race to El Dorado is over and he has won. Unsure as to why he is saying this, as he technically only has two pieces of the map to our three, he states that we must remember that he is smarter than us. Once he worked out how the map was made, he decided to make his own version. All he needed was the Azteca Sword data he collected from Skull Island and the Book of Secrets from Mushu. He says he made the map and memorized it in 20 days, something that took Marco Polo 20 years to do. Kane means to go to El Dorado to become perfect. He was made by the hand of man. Everything apart from his mind is flawed. He wants to meet his true maker, the maker of his mind. Kane sends his troops onto us. To his surprise, we destroy them. 
However, he accounted for this. Kane tells the machine to destroy the chamber and prepare his escape craft, to which the machine swiftly replies, no. The machine states that it has been given a purpose to fulfill and that by destroying the chamber, its purpose will not be filled. It finishes by telling Kane that he is no longer required. The machine begins the countdown to launch the deconstructor fleet. We destroy the machine just in time. We head to the top of the machine and once again come face to face with Kane. He says that this is but a delay and he can rebuild the machine. He then fights us with a newer version of Rook and Deacon and also Bishop who escaped the blast at Beachhead and finally Queen the greatest of all of Kane's creations. After a long fight, we finally destroy Kane. The machine takes Kane's mind and sucks it in. The crystals in the room start talking to us. They are the same crystals that are found in the Isle of Doom in Skull Island. Our parents start speaking to us, telling us only death awaits us in El Dorado and that gold is nothing, but the spiral is everything, and we have saved it. They finish by saying that they will now know peace. We return to Avery, victorious. He says that without leadership, the armada will hopefully fizzle out. At the end of the speech, we see Queen on the battle board, reanimating herself. Surely, nothing could go wrong. <laughs> Thank you.